Good morning, everyone. We're thrilled to welcome you back today. It's going to be a wonderful session on the outbreak narratives of contagion. And we have three fabulous speakers. We're just going to do a few announcements first, and then we'll get right to it. Um, you can see, hopefully, on your screen, there's a large slide here that was um, that's put together by some of your colleagues in your in your class. This is student run, and I just want to call your attention to it and remind everyone that this is an election year, um, in case any of us have forgotten. And it's really critical to make sure that you're registered to vote. Um, I believe you're probably all of the age now where you can do that, and it's just such a critical step for our democracy. So please make sure you're registered to vote. Um, great, we can take that slide down if you want. Thank you. Um, we're also thrilled that we um, wanted to just mention that we were grateful to have the opportunity to have a conversation about diversity and inclusion in the course. We are so grateful to the students who have and continue to raise this important issue. We welcome any conversations you'd like to have with either Alan and myself or any of your teaching fellows. So please know that we're available anytime, whether you want to come join us in office hours or if you want to set up a separate appointment and of course through your teaching fellows. So with that, we're going to go right to our poll questions. We have two poll questions today, if we could put those up. Interesting. So um, the question was, would you volunteer at this time to participate in a COVID vaccine trial phase three with placebo arm? So the vast majority, 65% of you said no, um, which is an interesting inflection point, both in our country and in this moment. So, um, so thank you. We'll do one more poll question before we transition over. So the question is, when do you think you will be vaccinated for COVID-19? Not when would you want to, but when will you? And there's a lot of options here. Okay, so we have a little bit more of a split. It looks like a little bit under half think, and the majority of you think it will be in, in between July and December of next year. And then the second largest option appears to be between January and June of next year. Um, no one thinks this fall, which is interesting. Um, and, and a very small group said never. Um, and, and also a small group said later than 2022. So most of you think sometime in the next year will be the time where you will be vaccinated. So put that in your capsule and think about that next year when we actually get those answers. So I'm going to just say one brief thing and then I'm going to hand it over to Alan. We are so thrilled for today's tremendous session that really is going to focus on how we narrate and convey stories of epidemics, their causes and effects. And this session is really going to explore how these accounts are structured and organized and how they really shape our deeper humanistic understandings about disease and their spread and responsibility and risk. And I'm just so thrilled to have these wonderful speakers. I'm going to pass it over to Alan to carry on and introduce people. Thanks, Ingrid. Um, Ingrid and I really wanted to have this session because we really want to create a foundation as we think more specifically about COVID-19, about how diseases get specific meanings and what the implications of those meanings are for societies and cultures um, now. And today we have three remarkable scholars who have all attended to those issues in different ways. Um, we have my colleague from History of Science, Professor Aram Alam, who special, specializes in um, migration and disease, issues of globalization, issues of ethnicity and place. Um, she's completing a fantastic book called Care of Foreigners that explains the migration of medical professionals, especially from Southeast Asia into the United States in the second half of the 20th century. Our second speaker will be Professor Jill Lepore 
from the history department. Um, Professor Lepour is one of our most well-known historians, a really a national and international treasure for bringing historical insight to wide audiences. Um, she's especially well known for her recent one volume history of the United States in these truths. And I'm very excited to congratulate her on her newest publication, which is published today. Um, it's called If Then, and it's a very critical tale of the use of social sciences and prediction in American politics and society. Um, I read part of it in The New Yorker earlier this year, and I have to say as the election has unfolded, its implications for the election are gigantic. But I also want to say she's written recently in The New Yorker about disease in the American past and um, polio and COVID. And so it's really great to welcome Professor Lepore here today. Our third speaker will be a colleague from Comparative Literature and East Asian Studies, Karen Thornburr. Um, Karen's been a leading scholar in what has emerged as a critical field and critically important to this course, medical humanities and environmental humanities. Um, she published a book this spring that in some ways anticipates so many of the questions that we want to ask today about meaning-centered approaches, how literature reflects characteristics of the disease experience in a deep social and cultural context. Um, her work is notable for the range of societies and cultures that she puts right next to one another in transcultural ways. And the book that she published this spring is fantastic. It's available on the web. Anyone can read it on the web, which is fantastic. And it's Global Healing, um, Literature, Advocacy, and Care. And I think you can tell me if this is right, Karen. If you just go on Amazon or anywhere, you can download the book or certainly through the Harvard Libraries. Um, not Amazon, but through the publisher. It's Brill in Leiden, uh, their website. Amazon, it's about $200. So okay. definitely go to Brill. Brill's being so accommodating and terrific at this time. And Which is a helpful. fantastic comment on just the accessibility of new scholarship. So please go there and take a look. So let me turn it over to Professor Alam, and I want to thank all three um, speakers for being with us today. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for the invitation to contribute a few thoughts um, and observations on the present pandemic. Okay. So the main question that I'd like to think about today is this. Faced with a global pandemic, why is there a rise in nationalist impulses and xenophobic rhetoric? My talk is going to it's called Foreign Bodies, COVID and Xenophobia. And I'm interested in asking this question of how the virus as a vector of disease that's foreign to the body gets collapsed and equated with bodies that are considered foreign to the imagination of the nation. So here I'm really thinking about the terms Chinese virus, Kung flu, Wuhan virus, foreign virus that we've I'm sure all heard bandied about. This rhetorical slippage has pretty serious consequences. The most obvious is the increase in hate crimes and racist incidents against the Asian American community over these last months. And as a historian, what I am attentive to are the logics and the discursive frames that are marshaled in these acts of naming and violence and really trying to excavate the residues from the past that help to explain why these racial and xenophobic scripts are ready at hand. So in the brief time that I have, I'm just gonna highlight two historical threads that have come together, I think to activate and embolden xenophobia and nationalism in relation to COVID-19. So I teach a course um, on medicine and health in America and on the first day of class, which was January 27th, of 2020s, just earlier this year, I showed the following set of political cartoons. 
This first one is from May 1882 and depicts San Francisco. And emanating from the boats in a congested residential space are three spectral figures with the words malaria, smallpox, and leprosy written on their garments. And the figure on the right is sending, I don't know, down or up or connecting. There's some sort of vaporous discharge um, that's maintaining a miasmatic link with a region that is labeled Chinatown. So a few weeks prior to the publication of this image, US Congress passed what was called the Chinese Exclusion Act. This bill prohibited the entry of Chinese laborers into the United States and prevented Chinese people who were already in the US from becoming citizens. The passage of this legislation was heavily motivated by fear of a contaminated Chinese body shedding contagion, coupled with really serious economic anxieties about Chinese laborers stealing US jobs. So I hope you hear kind of the resonances of these economic arguments today. So during that time in the 1880s, the US was experiencing what was considered to be the original Great Depression, the Long Depression, caused by the failure of railroad companies, which heavily recruited Chinese labor. So you have this expansion of the railroads, you have this influx of Chinese labor, then you have this bankruptcy of railroads, and now you have kind of this floating Chinese labor force, and what are we going to do with these people that are here? So through this Chinese Exclusion Act, public health arguments and economic discourses were recruited to really codify an antagonistic relationship to something understood as Chinese into US law. So the second image is a more recent illustration from the 2003 SARS-CoV-1 outbreak, so the you know, precursor to our current moment. This outbreak lasted about eight months and was contained relatively quickly. Um, the United States only experienced 115 cases and there were no reported deaths. In this image, there's an open Chinese takeout container labeled SARS and a vapor emanating from this box. The caption below reads bad Chinese takeout. And for the sake of time, I'm not gonna do a more in-depth analysis, but I hope that the resonances with the previous cartoon are pretty clear to you as you think about this. So the final image is from January 23rd, 2020. And in this illustration, there are shipping boxes labeled with the Corona Wuhan virus and a Reaper figure on the left saying, quote, a Chinese export with a tariff you don't wanna pay. So in this depiction, the spread of viral contagion is refracted through Trump's trade war with China. So taken together, these three representations, which span 138 years, reinforce this idea of an adversarial and paranoid relation to the Chinese body. And I think that they promote this idea that there's some, this relation is necessary to prevent US biological and economic death. It's necessary to preserve US life. In this project of preserving US life, every citizen is always already conscripted which is my second point. In this project of preserving US life, like I said, every citizen is already enrolled. And many scholars have provided an analysis of the state of permanent and total war inaugurated after World War II and reconfigured and expanded during the War on Terror. In this new regime, war is no longer an event on a battlefield between two sides, bounded by time and space, and instead, it's a permanent state of militarization that enrolls a civilian population um, in the continual project of risk assessment and mitigation. So this is really exemplified in the statement that I'm sure we're all familiar with at this point, that if you see something, say something. And in this injunction, identifying and naming an enemy, which is often conjured using some combination of history, fantasy, and anxiety, is followed by a rapid commandment to act. 
So, and in return for this participation and this vigilance, there is this promise of total security, total control, and a closed and impervious body politic. So we have our present moment where the Surgeon General calls COVID a quote, Pearl Harbor and 9-11 moment. And interpreting this virus, which has no inherent political ideology through attacks on the United States, there's a dangerous equation that's operating here. So when this metaphor of war is explicitly activated against a disease, hospitals are battlefields, care workers are on the front lines, and every patient a warrior, the potential civilian who can very easily become a patient is called to stand at attention and urgently search for an enemy. But a viral threat, it poses a peculiar challenge for this total war apparatus because each body has the potential to host a virus and to be held hostage by this foreign vector. So the vigilant citizen who's enrolled to surveil the threat can really, really quickly morph into an asymptomatic weapon of mass destruction through a dirty doorknob. They can become the very terror that they're enlisted to police, turning into the most intimate kind of enemy and carrying this foreigner within. So risk becomes this omnipresent and uncontainable problem that has to be dealt with. And I think what we're seeing is an externalization of this unknowability and this anxiety into these familiar racialized and militarized tropes. So with COVID, it's the resurrection of the script which has framed Chinese bodies as diseased, an economic and public health plague on American life over a century. And when the language of security and vigilance is social distance rather than physical distance, we really risk activating this kind of communalism um, and this mentality in which we start to think about people in a different kind of um, fabric than we're used to. So the social is something that we have to continually redefine in this moment and to think about the language that we use to do so. Because as I'm sure we'll hear later on, language is very, very powerful and the metaphors and the narratives that we use guide the responses on every level. So I will stop there and be open to questions. Thank you. Alan, I think you just have to unmute yourself. Here we go. I just said, thanks so much. Um, fantastic start for this discussion. And now we'll turn to Professor Lepore. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, it's a real honor to, to join these wonderful colleagues in this really important class. And I wish I could be in a room with you all to have this conversation and see your faces and chat with you afterward. And I just, I feel like it's important to acknowledge that um, and that loss because uh, these connections are so important, but they're also not, I think, entirely what we need. Um, I'm so struck by the richness of the insight, insights uh, of, of that presentation. And it calls to mind to me what I think of as some of the fundamental intellectual work that humanists do in detecting patterns. Um, in this case, you know, just thinking about the juxtaposition of those visual images from across a century and a half, what it is um, what it is that Professor Alam is able to see and notice and detect in those patterns, what that knowledge offers to us uh, in understanding and equipping us for thinking about the, the rhetorical nationalism of our present day moment and, and the kind of weaponization of uh, fear of disease and of risk in the interests of a kind of violent nationalism of a, of a security state. One of the things I'm so fascinated by as a historian is the paradox of, to me, the great tremendous value of that kind of pattern detection and its significant denigration in public discourse. That is to say, I don't think we learn as a as a public in the public sphere from humanistic knowledge. We don't value it. We don't esteem it. Uh, we, we barely ever see it outside of contexts like this, um, a liberal arts education. We don't, we don't see that presentation uh, on the nightly news. Um, 
we will see public health experts and uh, maybe some historians talking about past presidential policy making, but we don't actually see literary critics or historians of science offer up a humanistic analysis, the product of a humanistic inquiry. And I, I raise this um, partly because I'm so stirred by the brilliance of that presentation, but because I think it really matters for how beleaguered we are by, by panic in the face of uncertainty um, and by the seeming novelty of, of, an ex, of this experience. Uh, this is not a novel experience for humanity. Um, it, it is, it's, it's an unusual experience, but the value of confronting this experience equipped with the perspective of history and literature and the history of art, uh, it seems overwhelming to me. And yet I despair of its lack of informing, informing our discourse and our decisions. So, um, I just want to talk a little bit about fiction. Um, when the, when the pandemic began, I was asked as an assignment to just write an essay about novels that had pandemics in them. And I never thought about that as a category of fiction before, um, you know, but I got a big box of books and I sat down and I read them in chronological order and did the work that a humanist does was look, try to detect a pattern in the stories that people tell about when a plague comes, what does it do? to people? How does it change our relationships to one another? How does it affect the political order? How does it change our relationship to the divine, to our sense of mortality? And of course, you know, this, this, it's, it's throughout all, all written uh, human production, right? We, there are stories of plagues that go, you know, back to the Bible, back to Greek antiquity. Oedipus Rex is a story about a plague. Uh, but I, I came to see that our modern fiction, the stories that we tell ourselves that I do think we try to slot this pandemic into, uh, emerge principally from, and it is in the English language tradition, I'm largely looking at English and American fiction, uh, from really what is an enlightenment narrative trope. Which, and so I thought a lot about a book um, that I suspect none of you have read, <laughs> I certainly hadn't read before, called The Last Man. It was written by Mary Shelley in 1826. Shelley had, uh, is best known, of course, for writing Frankenstein um, uh, several years before. But The Last Man in 1836, 1826 is the first modern novel that predicts the extinction of humanity through a global pandemic. It was quite an extraordinary thing to even imagine in 1826. Um, there had, certainly have, have been terrible diseases, but because transportation was limited, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to even conceive of the possibility that the diseases could be communicated far and wide enough that all of humanity could possibly come to an end. And how Shelley imagined this story, it's quite like Frankenstein in a way, um, how she imagined it and how she conceived of what would happen were such a plague to come. She anticipated um, that uh, she relied on the Enlightenment understanding of human progress. So Enlightenment thinkers understood that humans had arisen, essentially climbed a ladder rung by rung from being essentially animals um, to, and this, there's a huge amount of racial conception to this Enlightenment notion of, of progress through a kind of chain of being up to, uh, you know, hunter gatherers, then farmers, then into Shelley's own age, the era of industrialization with uh, a broadening of learning uh, and the acquisition of knowledge through the preservation of knowledge in the form of writing as a part of this ascent from what enlightenment writers would have called savagery to what they would have called civilization. And as, as, as Shelley conceived it, what happens in a pandemic is that we begin falling down that ladder, rung by rung by rung. You know, we first sacrifice the arts and music and theater, the highest accomplishments in that enlightenment conception uh, of the sequence of human development. You know, then, then we, you know, then we begin, our politics begins to fall apart, our structures of government and reliability, other institutions. Then people abandon cities, 
and we become a rural people once again. Then we become a, a warring rural people, uh, just vying over territory and, and scant resources. We lose the ability to read and write. So in, in the end, we have descended back to living essentially as animals. And that's how Shelley conceived of what happens <laughs> in a pandemic. And the way she tells the story, she imagines a time in the future, I think, it's 2092 or something when the, the the last man is alive there's a few stragglers who survived they heard goats um but that anxiety really does survive into our day i mean in an, i was really haunted by this particular account because i had read it at the very beginning of the of, of the disease showing up in the united states i had in fact just come back from vietnam um where I remember it being in the airport in Hong Kong uh, and being told if you were not, not feeling well to go to a first aid tent and people were very perplexed by this. Um, but I had just come back to the United States and they're just reported to be the cases. And then I read this book um, and then the theaters closed and then concerts were canceled and then the schools closed. Um, and it felt to me that there was something beyond the kind of narrative insight of Shelley into the, re, you know, the reality of what happens to institutions during a public health crisis, where it seemed to me such a lost opportunity that there wasn't a conversation about what it means to give these things up. Um, and what we can think about, even in terms of our own decisions day by day, how we hold on to, even if you want to reject the Enlightenment's notion of progress, how we hold on to poetry in a time like this. Um, I have a colleague who has been sending everyone she knows on a mailing list a poem every day uh, just to get through this time. Um, how we hold on to uh, the beauty of humanity. Um, and one of the ways we hold on to it is by looking to literature. So uh, <laughs> I guess I just wanna say that um, there is a way to celebrate the human struggle against adversity through the study of literature, but there is also knowledge to be gained that is applicable to how we confront our own tendency for evil and for prejudice and for discrimination by looking at how past societies have faced these same matters. So just to kind of amplify, um, there's terrible lessons to be learned in the past, but there is also inspiration to be taken from literature. Thanks. Thanks so much, Professor Lepore. Um, we're going to come back to some of these issues during the question and answer, but I'll just raise one quick question that we might want to think about, which is we see these patterns in literature and historically and yet it's hard, it seems both hard to resist the pattern and there's something highly specific about our own moment. So one of the questions I have for the humanities and thinking about disease meaning is this larger problem of these patterns that we could find over time of fear, hatred, xenophobia, um, panic, and yet how are they working out in a particular environment for us now? And how do we recover some of the things we could from a meaning-centered approach to thinking about resisting some of those more, um, th those more difficult and dangerous impulses that epidemics really sometimes unleash? So let me turn it over to Professor Thornburr and um, she's thought a lot about this, especially from the literary perspectives um, that have already come up. So, Professor Thornburn. Okay, thank you so much, Alan. And it's such an honor to be with you all today, and particularly to be with my colleagues, Jill and Aram. And wow, just amazing presentations that, and particularly thank you to Jill because I'm teaching the last man in my freshman seminar on literature pandemics and epidemics and now I have like the opening cell so this is great okay so I'm going to screen share here okay and here we go okay 
Uh, so that's just my email address. Definitely get in touch with me if anyone has questions, anyone wants to follow up with anything. Um, I was asked to address two key questions for discussion here, and I will get to them uh, momentarily. However, first, I just wanted to do a little plug for my book, although Alan has already done that, so we'll keep this short. Uh, I was just, this book was just coming out in March, just as everything was shutting down. And so I don't actually talk about coronavirus in Global Healing because my last revisions were due, I think before the first deaths uh, from COVID-19 and before, before the first cases in the United States. So we really, it was kind of maybe there at the background of the news, but, but certainly wasn't a thing. Um, and yeah, just I just have here what I referred or what I mean by global healing. I'll talk more about this uh, later, but basically refers broadly to shattering stigmas surrounding diseases and other adverse health conditions, humanizing healthcare by fully implementing person-focused care and by prioritizing care partnerships. And so even though the book doesn't address uh, COVID-19 explicitly, a lot of the big arguments that it raises uh, remain relevant. And I think this points to the fact that as Jill pointed out, the coronavirus might be called the novel coronavirus, but in many ways, at least the so in terms of the social dynamics and social responses, it's not all that new. And what literature I think can make particularly clear is that alleviating the suffering that's associated with adverse health conditions involves much more than developing new medical treatments. In the case of COVID-19, of course, we're a lot of attention on the vaccine, but also uh, treatments uh, for the disease. Um, alleviating suffering also requires fundamentally transforming how we treat one another, how we treat ourselves, how we treat the planet, everything from how we interact from loved ones uh, and strangers alike, or interact with loved ones and strangers alike, uh, within families and healthcare settings and well beyond to the types of leaders and policies that we support and for whom we advocate. And all these things are quite big in literature. So uh, I wanna turn now to uh, the first of the questions. This is where we'll be spending most of my time this morning that Professor Brandt and Professor Katz asked me. Uh, namely, what can global comparative approaches to literature and literary theory offer us, uh, particularly as concerns our understanding of the stigmas associated with disease and the care of infected peoples? And I want to break this question into three parts. The first, global comparison. The second, stigma. And the third uh, being literature. So just, uh, just uh, going over briefly here, uh, what I see anyway as some of the benefits of a global or at least transnational approach. I think on this, this all draws on, as Alan mentioned, my experience with literature from a broad range of cultures in a broad range of, of languages. But of course, you know, there are many languages and cultures that I don't uh, include. And there's a lot more work to be done uh, in this field for sure. Um, so first, it's giving context to what we personally, those closest to us, are experience. Um, I think one of the examples that I raise in my gen ed course on disease, illness, and health through literature, it's a rather extreme example, but it's one that comes up actually quite a bit in literature, and that is end of life, it relates to end of life decisions, in particular uh, when individuals have a loved one uh, who's at the end of life and is begging for their assistance in bringing their life to an end. And this is a dilemma that we see in literature, at least from the time of the ancient Greeks. And we see it in literature from all over the world. And this is something I hadn't expected when I started doing research for global healing, but I kept stumbling on these stories uh, in, you know, in memoirs and plays and so on. And you know, having taught this material for a number of years, I think what becomes particularly apparent to me and to I hope the students in my class is that sometimes we approach issues like this, you know, death with dignity. Is that something that should be allowed? Is that something that should be prohibited? What kind of barriers do we enact and so forth? That many of us have particularly strong opinions on this, but without putting our opinions into a broader context. And secondly, here on this slide, you'll see access to a broader range of experiences. 
we don't really hear what some of the options might be and what other approaches have been. And this, I think literature does give us access to a much broader range of experiences. And also related to this, it helps us reduce exceptionalism. You know, the feeling that we or someone else are unique or special or different or particularly deserving or particularly undeserving. We saw some of this exceptionalism uh, documented, I think, really clearly in the slides that Iram was showing us. Taking a global perspective also helps us reduce hierarchies. It helps us reduce stereotypes. It helps us better understand that experiences and expectations regarding illness do not divide cleanly by nation or ethnicity or sexuality, gender, religion, socioeconomic status, race, and so on, all the ways in which we divide people. That illness experience uh, for many individuals is a very individual experience and we cannot make assumptions about others in in the ways that, that we have been doing. These are some of the benefits of I think a global or at least the transnational approach. I want to turn now to the question of shattering stigmas and of course Professor Brandt is the expert on this topic but I'll just offer a few words here. In general I'm loath to speak about universals and I, I bristle when I hear talk of you know certain trends or or tendencies, but then all the examples given are, are from the West. And because, you know, I do a lot of my work in East Asia, um, more work now with African literatures. And, and so I, I kind of bristle uh, at use of the term unique because it's, you know, often used only when we're looking at one particular subset. But if I were to, um, or not the word unique, the word universal, sorry about that. But if I were to be comfortable with one thing that I think is pretty universal, uh, that is stigmas surrounding disease. Of course, there are many other things that are broad in, you know, widely spread among societies, but we'll focus on stigmas here. I think one of the real surprises that um, for me when I was doing research for my book were the number of literary works that talked about pretty devastating diseases. And the examples I give in the book are leprosy, HIV AIDS, uh, and Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Of course, there are many other diseases uh, for which this holds true as well, where whether you're looking at memoirs or drama or poetry or any other form of writing, what I saw a lot of were writers who even when they're talking about really devastating diseases that cause tremendous changes to the human body, to human behavior, what individuals talked about even more than the physical changes or in the case of dementia, the uh, mental changes were the stigmas as causing the most suffering. And to me, anyway, this was quite a surprise, but I kept seeing it, whether I was looking at African HIV AIDS narratives, whether I was looking at uh, literature on leprosy from early China or India or from the Bible. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that literature has done in the past, and I'll get to literature uh, momentarily, is, um, uh, revealed a lot of these stigmas. No, I'm sorry. In the past, literature has enforced a lot of these stigmas. And so we tend not to go to earlier literature to be enlightened about you know, ways to counter stigma. But you see a real turn against that uh, in you know, late 20th century, early 21st century, where literature is being used as a way uh, to shatter stigmas, to reveal stigmas as more pernicious uh, than, the, than the diseases. Um, themselves. And just a uh, final slide, or final slide here. Um, as I said a moment ago, historically literature hasn't always gotten it right. In fact, uh, it's long been used to propagate stigmas and stereotypes, uh, but there has been a real change in the last few decades. And I think what makes the literature, a lot of literature anyway, particularly powerful is that it focuses on the individual anguish amid broader so social and economic uh, dynamics in society, including, of course, inequality and violence. 
and show it, so it shows in ways that other forms of narrative do not, the penetrating damage caused by current practices and the pressing need to transform how we better or how we prepare for and respond to crises in health. And I would never say that literature provides us with all the answers. I don't believe that to be true. But I do think that literature can add a lot uh, to our conversations. It just provides us with a different perspective on disease experience and in many cases gives us a face uh, to these numbers and statistics that we continually hear. It gives us a face, it gives us an experience, it gives us a story. And uh, I could talk a lot more about literature, but I know that I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to wrap up here. Uh, the second uh, big question that uh, Ingrid and Alan asked me related to the creative writing surrounding COVID-19. So I put on the slide here uh, some examples from the US, the UK, and China. Italy has also seen a lot of uh, production of literary works on COVID-19. I don't think any are translated into English yet. So I've just put here uh, things that are in English. Uh, these are materials that uh, some of them actually we just discussed last night in my freshman seminar. We'll also be discussing these materials in my gen ed course on disease um, literature and health. I want to call your attention uh, to the, the final line here, the library guide on Black COVID. They've uh, been collecting uh, writings on Black American experience in the COVID era. The library has and has this great uh, website. The poetry link is only one part of it. They also do other forms of literature. And the library is continually adding to this. I think it's a little too early to say, you know, this is what COVID literature is because the kind of work that I'm reading, including the materials listed here, is so, so incredibly diverse and is addressing so many different parts of the COVID experience. But these are just some examples uh, for you. Many are available uh, via the Harvard libraries and definitely encourage you to take a look. I particularly maybe I'd recommend um, for those of you who aren't as familiar with what's been happening in China, uh, Fang Fang's Wuhan diary dispatches from a quarantine city because she takes us from the beginning uh, of, the, of the quarantine in Wuhan uh, to uh, I think the end of the, of the quarantine but doesn't just talk about what it's like to be stuck inside her apartment for days on end. She talks a lot about the politics behind the disease. She talks about how the disease is affecting different segments of the population and so on. And it's also um, gotten a lot of uh, quite negative um, attention, been quite criticized uh, by Chinese authorities, been censored and so on. So really brings to light, I think, a lot of the dynamics that we've been talking about today. So I think I'll wrap up there. I'm probably out of time and want to thank you all and definitely be in touch uh, with me if there are any questions or you'd like to discuss anything going further. Thanks so much, Professor Thornburg. These three presentations couldn't go better together than I I could imagine. And I think one of the questions that we have in the course is obviously we're following the scientific and epidemiological and policy issues associated with COVID. But Ingrid and I felt very strongly that having this kind of humanistic and historical foundation for thinking about the problem would expand beyond the bureaucratic and administrative debates that are taking place. But it has occurred to me that a lot of aspects of what you're talking about are characteristics of other historical epidemics. Obviously, it's hard to imagine an epidemic where there aren't some forms of stigmatization. Um, in this epidemic, we've had many reports that the epidemic itself is a hoax or denial of the patterns of transmission or the characteristic of data and treatment. Um, we've seen xenophobia, which we typically see in epidemics. So I'm wondering, as you look at some of those variables, you know, how can we recover a more substance and sense of the um, social meanings of disease that help us get an edge on how to think through the pandemic we're living in. And you all have addressed that in some way, but I really open that up to any of you. Are there, are there aspects, and I certainly agree with um, you know, what Karen just said, 
we're not going to find the answers to solving every problem in literature, but are there are there strategies for reducing stigmas or opposing the denial of certain kinds of scientific realities that the three of you see in the way that you conceive the problem? Um, thanks, Alan. I, I can jump in and, and speak a little bit about that. I mean, I, I think I mentioned that when I was doing this reading that I was reading the books chronologically. And so the first thing I read was Daniel Defoe's Journal of a Plague Year uh, from 1722, but which is describing a plague in 1665 in London. And I, I would say I'm pretty averse to false historical analogies. Like I just can't stand it when someone says, no, oh, it's just like George Wallace today. We're talking about Trump. Like, no, it's not. We're, just, we're not remotely talking about that. Um, but it was quite chilling how much of what Defoe described seemed applicable. And I really struggled with what it is about his capacity to see patterns that transcended historical time. And in a deep way, what he was describing was the terror of discovering that other human beings are dangerous to you, even the people that you love the most, and, and how likely it is then to come to really fear the people that you didn't even love in the first place. Um, and that what's called for is a, a, a deeper love, right? That, that you know, he, he, he talked about, you know, describing the, the plague, um, that the rich were the least generous. The poor would take care of one another, but the rich just tried to get out of the city no matter, you know, as fast as they could, um, taking stuff that they knew other people needed more, like that, the, and that there was just this, for him, this really remarkable line between people who had led a life of acquisition, like acquiring and hoarding goods to themselves that would improve their lives and that could very well be taking resources away from others and people who never had very much and knew that they needed to share, like somehow that the, the world could be divided in such a way. Um, so this kind of just deep call for general, like that what is called for is generosity. Uh, something I, I just found, cause that, that's the last thing that you hear <laughs> in American political discourse, like who was calling for generosity at the, 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 the great, tendency to turn inward in this crisis is exactly um, what makes it hardest to bear, right? So even if you're, even if, even if you have the capacity for generosity and love to protect other people, you need to be separate from them. Like the, all of these paradoxes are available to us for scrutiny and for consideration. And if I were say an office holder and I had read Defoe, it would really shape how I might think about how I maybe ought to talk to people about what it means um, to not touch people, uh, but to nevertheless love them at a distance. <laughs> and that has not really been part of our present discourse. So I, I'm sorry, just rambling here, but trying to kind of come to a way to think about what we, what we gain from, the, from these insights that does apply, that isn't some kind of fake historical analogy, but that just recognizes the human condition. I think that's, you know, really helpful. I guess I would say, you know, I think there are forces in the history of epidemics where we've seen people, you know, try to support one another. And we see these very divisive forces of abandonment and, you know, and um, individual, um, you know, acquisition and departure. And I kind of watched this change a bit during the HIV epidemic, which started with brutal hostility to gay people and people who might be at risk. And I sometimes have seen the inflection point at the, um, at the AIDS quilt. And all of our students may not have seen this or remember it, but people began to sew commemorative quilts to honor a loved one who had been lost. And then they would stitch these quilts together and it ultimately became like 30,000 quilt panels stitched together related to a deep history of quilt making in the US. And people would come see the quilt laid out. It was laid out on the Washington Mall. 
and then walk around and meet other people who were grieving and who had lost a loved one to HIV. And it kind of was this transition from hostility and resentment to identification. And I think, you know, from a literary and humanistic point of view, the ability to identify with the other rather than to other seems to me one of the themes that's built into this. Ingrid, maybe you had a question you wanted to pose. Well, I think, um, and I want to be mindful since we are actually going to have adequate time for our fantastic, I see some questions rolling in. So maybe I'll ask a question and then we can um, open it up for our students to ask some of theirs. I really want to follow on that theme, Alan, that you raised in the context of this really phenomenal conversation. And thank you all for your thoughts. Um, particularly in relation to Professor Alam's comment around um, this moment of foreign bodies and the militarization of um, these images and person as other, you know, that, that your neighbor suddenly becomes the enemy or um, as Professor Lepore is saying, that person that you love can suddenly, there's a complexity in that relationship. Um, and also all the things that make us human and bring us joy in so many ways, going to the theater, um, partaking in an indoor dining experience with 10 of your best friends close together in a, in a booth or something like that. And I wonder how you reflect on this moment, this complexity of these very different images where the person that you may know well is suddenly kind of the enemy. And I. I feel like a lot of us experienced this in the early days where we would go outside and some people would be masked and some people wouldn't and there'd be these exchanges that people would be having that weren't necessarily verbal, but these have been ongoing um, threads throughout this pandemic of how we are with each other and how can we look in this, you know, humanistic lens to consider this moment as you are writing your narratives of this moment, what would you say? And any, that could be to anyone. This one comment to just build off of that a little bit is I think part of what has produced the militarization is not only that somebody that I love can be the enemy, it's that I can actually be the enemy, I think is what is also a really important site of fear. And I cannot know that I'm the enemy. So what, I, the, you know, the thing that I'm supposed to be most intimate with can be most foreign simultaneously. And I think that holding that is a really uncomfortable thing to, to deal with so that, you know, I become host and hostage to this viral thing and then I can simultaneously um, transmit it. And so I think that that produces a, a vigilance. Um, I think is probably what you were referring to when you're talking about, you know, th these things you, you watch people across the street and their noses are like, all of this mask wearing etiquette and things. But, um, but I think it also, you know, using this rhetoric, we're talking about paying attention to the human aspects. I mean, language creates worlds. So if we create a world where we're talking about we're talking about enemies and we're talking about front lines and um, we're talking about being infiltrated by this thing or taken hostage, then it invokes a whole entire repertoire that precedes us, you know, that has used these things. So Pearl Harbor, what happened after Pearl Harbor? I mean, the arms race, the dropping of the atomic bomb, what happened after 9-11, the war on terror, which continues today, you know, and the displacement of over 37 million people, as was just reported. So it, I think that we have to think about the kinds of language and imagery that we're invoking and what that all brings with it. So maybe, you know, one of the things that we can do um, as far as thinking about militarization is to demilitarize our own language you know we valorize the front line etc but we have to think about what effects how does that reverberate in the ways that we interact with one another um, yeah I, I think that's deeply profound and and important in this moment 
So it goes I, back to yeah, a yeah. classic work in the medical humanities, Susan Sontag's illness as metaphor. And she was suffering from cancer and all the cancer metaphors were bombarded, you know, knock it out. Um, and they were all military. And then the metaphor of cancer was often used as a cancer on the body politic. So she cautioned all of us about how we use metaphors and the impact that they have. I was just thinking as you were talking that, you know, this notion of the enemy within, you know, that was a common notion during the Cold War about communism. So these are very powerful projections of the issues that, you know, the three of you have raised so much. Let me just raise one quick final question for um, Professor Thornburg. As you were talking about loss from disease and grief, it occurred to me that one of the things that's been so striking about COVID is that when people want to be with somebody who is dying, they typically have not been able to. And we're going through a whole new ritualization of funerals and grieving digitally. And I'm just wondering, in terms of your understanding of suffering and grief, if you see particular aspects that have been um, really importantly challenging as you think about the characteristics of this pandemic. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Alan, for, for that question, which I think is a really important one. Um, we had my father's memorial service um, over Zoom. Uh, my father died last December. We didn't, you know, with COVID and all that, we didn't have anything right away. Um, and then it, it was not how I anticipated um, saying goodbye uh, to my father. So it, the, the question strikes a personal and a professional note. Um, it's also a question that came up. I was part of a panel with the Harvard Libraries on Friday um, showcasing their Black COVID uh, collection. And so for those uh, students who are interested in this, and I actually put the link in my slides, I think this is a really good resource. But this is something that I, I believe it was Professor Evelyn Hammonds of History of Science who brought this up and said what we haven't been talking about nearly as much as we should be is the mourning and the grieving, not only of individuals who have died from conditions other than COVID and now we're you know, doing memorials and funerals on, online, um, but especially in this current era, um, the mourning and the grieving of, of those who have died uh, from, from COVID. I think this is a, it's a really profound question. It's one uh, to which I don't uh, have an you know, easy answer, really any answer at all, except to say that um, this is, it's out of this morning, at least when we look to, to past disease outbreaks, epidemic, that a lot of our literature, again, literature configured really broadly, other narratives have come. And they've come in such a way as to help us work through or think about, give us more space to think about um, what these losses mean individually, in a family, in a community, but also what, if anything, they will enable us, others, uh, to change uh, going forward. Um, I, I do get a little nervous when I see, and then I'm, you know, dutifully watch CNN, other news, you know, the number kind of tracker, like this many cases, this many deaths. And of course, each of those deaths is a person, it's a family, it's a community in many cases of people who are affected. And hearing those stories, giving individuals space to tell their stories, to be heard, but that not as an ending, that as a beginning of making the kind of transformative change that we so desperately need in this country and so many other places around the world. So I don't think that really answers your question, except to say that the process of loss and disease and uh, loss and, and grief, I, th I think is one that has been a bit overshadowed by some of the other issues that are, are forefront on our minds. But it's something that has affected so many people so profoundly that um, I, I think we're going to see a lot more writing on this topic and a lot more conversations 
on this topic uh, going going forward. So. Thanks. Um, th these are such important um, observations about the pandemic. Um, our students are all going to be doing podcasts. And what we hope is that they'll have a chance to collect stories um, on one aspect or another of these deeply human and often less articulated aspects of the pandemic. And we're hoping to archive those as a kind of representation of a variety of voices that often aren't highly represented in the history of pandemics. We often know it's hard to recover um, these kinds of stories. So this has just been great. Let's, Ingrid, shall we invite some students? To ask up. We have a lot of great questions from students, so feel free um, to bring them in. <laughs>